Now let's jump back into Philippians and I do want to be sensitive to the request about the expository element that is the explanatory element of a text. And I'd like both by precept and example to talk about that. It's very timely when we come to the most theological section of Philippians. This has a formal name, Philippians 2, 5 through 11 in New Testament studies. It's called the Kenotic passage, K-E-N-O-T-I-C. Now, that's inside language. I wouldn't say that from the pulpit, incidentally. I don't like to use in preaching to the congregation as a whole technical theological terms. So I would not at church in the morning, if the place is full of folks coming to church, I wouldn't say now today, we're going to consider the canonic passage. That's off-putting. But that is inside baseball. You need to be able to learn some of that language if you're going to be a preacher or a teacher. If you're going to be a physician or a nurse or a solicitor, you're, you're going to have to learn some inside language. But you need to translate that into, uh, well, I've invented a fellow in the United States. I bring him into my classroom. I call him Joe Sixpack. <laughs> now, a six pack is uh, half a dozen of a certain beverage. <laughs> and uh, he's the guy who wanders into church. Maybe his wife made him come. Maybe his kids made him come. He's not usually there. He's sitting way up here somewhere. I like to keep Joe Sixpack in mind when I'm preaching. Am I making this gospel in any way land in his lap? He hasn't been reading the Bible. If I talk to him about Greek and Hebrew, he says, oh, I know a little Greek. Uh, he runs a restaurant up here. <laughs> little Hebrew has a tailor shop. He doesn't have a clue what I'm talking about. I want to communicate with Joe Sixpack, but internally, I've got to know some technical language. And when you talk about the canotic passage, that's from the Greek word kenosis. We're talking about exposition. Having this attitude in yourselves, Philippians 2, 5, famous verse, which is in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but, and here's the word, the kenosis, emptied himself. It's one of the most debated, discussed, expository words in all of the 13 Pauline epistles. He emptied himself. Now, every word of this deserves biblical exposition. He existed, that's his pre-existence, in the morphe. Now, that gives us, in science, the word morphology. It means the inner essence of something. His morphe, and incidentally on Sunday also, I don't say Greek words in the pulpit. I'm talking to you as people interested in exposition. So this Saturday morning, I'm using them. I don't clutter the sermon up for Joe Sixpack's sake up there with Greek words. But I would use several, several synonyms. His inward essence, the very center of him. The form of him inwardly was God. When you see that itinerant Galilean preacher sitting on a wellside, weary, speaking to the woman in Samaria, his inner essence was God. <laughs> but it says he emptied himself. Now this is a great passage for exposition if you just follow, and I like to use, once again, image to help support exposition. He stooped to conquer. Now if you're familiar with <laughs> theater, Oliver Goldsmith's 1775 play, He Stooped to Conquer, I would say that, it, she stooped to conquer, I would say that to support the exposition. 
Not to replace it, but to support it. Now let's look at the exposition. He was in the morphe. His inner essence was God, but he took on the schematic evidence of a human. Now that's one step down. Look at this like an escalator going down, an escalator, a down escalator. He got on the down escalator. He took upon himself the form of a human. Well, yes. Why couldn't he be a Caesar or a Cicero or a Plato? No, no, no. Not just any human, but a bond servant, a slave. Well, all right, a slave to live to a ripe old age and be assumed back to heaven? No. And death? Well, yes. Maybe to die like Socrates drinking poison. No, no, even the death of the what? The cross. It's a downward escalator. God, man, not just any man, but a servant and not a servant who'd be assumed back into heaven like a fiery chariot, like Elijah, but huh, a bond servant who would die, but not just any death. The most ignominious death of all, the death of the cross. But you find this word in the text, therefore God has highly exalted him. The, the word means to, verse nine, to super exalt him. That is for every step down, there was more than a compensating step back up. He was raised, but not only was he raised, he ascended. And not only did he ascend, he ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And not only did he ascend back to the right hand of the Father, Hebrews 4 calls him our great high priest. But not only that, he's been given a new name. And at that name, Every knee shall bow. For every step down, there was more than a compensating step back up. Now, if I use the image to support that exposition in Oliver Goldsmith's play, and I don't want that image to dominate, but it's an interesting play. If you remember it, Kate is a, a, a refined noble woman. She's interested uh, romantically in a nobleman, but he didn't like refined noble women. He wanted something less than that. So she takes on that role in She Stooped to Conquer in order <laughs> to attract him. But then he finds out who she really was. If you don't like that image, let me give you another one. Peter the Great founded uh, Tsarist Russia, built St. Petersburg. Peter the Great, the Tsar. Now here is a bizarre thing about the Tsar, pun intended. He was also in his army and he was a captain in his own army. Now let that sink in. He was the czar, but in his army, he had the rank of captain reporting back up the chain of command to himself. <laughs> That's approximate to the remarkable thing that has no analogy and that is a member of the Holy Trinity eternally generated, a member of the Holy Trinity takes on humanity, not just any that of a slave, becomes obedient, but not just any obedience to death, not just any death, but the cross. And yet at the time of the very bottom of that, the very bottom of that, he is in a sense reporting back up to himself. <laughs> Remarkable analogy in this canonic passage, and that is Philippians chapter two. And this is a place where I really think it helps to have some, some image support this incredible, almost unexplainable reality of God going down the escalator, coming back up the escalator. You know, sometimes I've just used the image of an escalator. Did you ever try to run, have you ever tried to run up a down escalator? When I was a little boy, we tried to do that. We had a lot of fun with escalators. You know, you know the, 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 the rubber rail that you hold on to? When I was a little boy, I used to wonder, where does that go? And does that one come back? So I put some bubble gum on it <laughs> and looked at how long it took the gum to come back around. That doesn't have anything to do with this. I don't even know why I'm talking about it. <laughs> 
Now, let's look at the next exposition, 2, 12 through 18. The dominant verse here is work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now here you have the image of working out what God is working in. The same thing from two perspectives. From your perspective, you're working it out. An expository parallel to that is Romans chapter six, when he talks about mortification, putting to death in your members. That's working it out. That's not just passivity. He says, reckon yourself to be dead, but he also says, mortify, put to death. That's working it out. But the other side of that is, and it keeps you from despair, what you're working out, God is working in. Now an image for that. Uh, Major Ian Thomas, uh, a deeper life speaker, used to take a a glove up to the pulpit. It was an empty white glove. It's a military man, uh, very impressive man. He'd wave this glove around, empty glove. And he'd say, I can command an empty glove. Glove, pick the Bible up. He'd flop the glove around. Of course, the glove didn't be the Bible. So it was almost an absurdity. Glove, pick up a pen. He'd wave it around. But then he'd say, when I put my hand in the glove, and very much play acting, he made a big theatrical deal out of putting his hand in the glove. What's possible for my hand becomes possible for the glove. And that was the image of working out what he is working in. On the one hand, with fear, with reverential awe, even to the point of trembling, mortification, putting to death that in my members, but recognizing he's working in what I'm working out. Let me give you another image to help explain that. People who don't know anything about chemistry know one chemical compound. I'll bet you. Nearly everybody here. N-A-C-L. Salt. Sodium chloride. N-A-C-L. Taken together, you've got to have them together. It's in the ocean. You can have too much of it in you, but you've got to have some of it in you or you won't be you. (laughs) But what if you divide those into two elements? If you divide them individually, both of them are noxious and poisonous and take life. Sodium is is an unstable element. Take a big dose of it by itself, you'll be in eternity. (laughs) Same thing with a chloride. It's poisonous, it's noxious, but you put them together and they're necessary for life. Now, if you look at what Paul says here, if all I'm doing is mortifying myself, that'll drive me to despair. Gregory, stop. Gregory, don't. Gregory, you can't. If all I do is mandate myself, command myself to put myself to death, that leads to despair. But on the other hand, if I take this blase, detached, Uh, unengaged, disengaged attitude. Well, thank God we'll work it out. (laughs) Just let him do what he's going to do. That will lead to the opposite. Presumption, antinomianism. (laughs) Shall we send so grace may abound? Really? Both of them by themselves would be noxious, but you put them together. Same time. For my part, working out with faith fear and trembling, the implications for everything in my life. But doing it, recognizing he's working in what I'm working out. 
So let some kind of images like that help the exposition of that which is a challenging phrase in and of itself. Now, let's uh, go a little further down here. Another image that's not familiar at all to the congregation today. Verse 17, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. Now that doesn't ring a bell at all for Joe Sixpack up in the balcony. <laughs> it comes completely out of Paul's world of animal, vegetable, and liquid sacrifices, both in paganism and in Hebrew scripture. You would bring to an altar an animal, and in a conflagration, that animal would be consumed. You would bring vegetables, the great wave offering of Hebrew scripture where you'd wave the grain before the Lord or a liquid libation. You would pour out the very best wine, not the bad stuff, the good stuff, <laughs> and watch it go up in smoke as a gift to the deity. Now that's totally, Joe Sixpack's up there. That is a difficult concept. I've got to paint a word picture and do it carefully. I've got to take time to talk about ancient worship. I like to call it the ABC, one, two, three days, the kindergarten, the preschool days of our relationship to God. Does God really need another head of cattle when he made all the cattle on all the hills? No, it was didactic, it was pedagogical, it was preschool. And it handed to Paul this image. He said, you at Philippi, you're in a sense, my ministerial sacrifice, your faith. I got beaten, I got jailed, I got ridiculed, I got humiliated to plant that house church at Philippi. And it's as if I were poured out like a liquid libation, the finest wine going up in smoke. But he said, that's my joy. Now, there you have a concept which in an expository way, you have to stop, pitch your tent, stay there and struggle to help Joe Six back up there, get an idea of what that image is because there's nothing about that that has an equivalent in the contemporary world that I can think of. That's just sheer exposition. Now, let's move on though to this next passage, which I want to spend a little bit of time on, 2.19 through the end of it, and that is the key word, if I could, would be a supporting actor. And that is this passage about Epaphroditus, verse 25. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, fellow soldier, who is your messenger and minister to my need. Remember, Paul's in jail in Rome. A faithful Christian brother named Epaphroditus goes to Philippi to take them this thank you note for their offering to support Paul, who had to provide for himself even though he was in jail. It was a pitiful situation. Remember, he writes, Later, tells him, bring, bring, the book, bring me the books, bring me the parchments, bring me the cloak I left. It's a pitiful situation. This man, Epaphroditus. Now think about this. Here's Epaphroditus with a little piece of papyrus. Maybe vellum. It might have been animal skin, probably. And it is the letter to the Philippian church. Now you think about this. Here's this common incognito, anonymous, unidentified man. He leaves Rome with this rolled up piece of papyrus <laughs> written on both sides. They didn't waste an inch of it. And he sails th across the Adriatic, comes to Greece and makes his way to Macedonia. And the whole time he's carrying one of the most famous pieces of correspondence in human history. 
Could you imagine if you get in some kind of time machine and go back there? I can't even imagine. Well, hey, Epaphras, would you just let me see it? <laughs> would you just let me, let me touch it? The letter to the Philippians. And nobody even knew he had it. I just let that sink in. Nobody even knew he had it. Now here's an image to help support that. I had a friend who uh, was a diamond trader. It's a rather dangerous business and sometimes a bloody business, of course. But when he was getting diamonds out of the mines, he said, you can't insure them. He said, there's no way to insure them. You don't insure them. Nobody will insure them. He said, you either put them in regular post and hope for the best, or you try to dress down as much as you can and you carry them out yourself. He said, you cannot insure diamonds mailing them. Well, he was a trader who carried them out. He tried to dress down <laughs> and just put them on himself and carry them out of the mines back to the wholesaler. In a sense, Epaphroditus was like God's diamond carrier. If you had seen him, you would have been astonished to know he was carrying one of the most beloved things. And let me say this, when you're carrying something for Jesus, whatever it is, you have no idea the ultimate impact of what you're carrying. That's not just Epaphroditus. That's anything you take on for him. You have no idea what you're carrying. Maybe a calling. I'm 16 years old. It's a June. It's a June summer night. And as clear as a voice out of heaven, I get a call to preach. I got up, came down an aisle just like this, told a youth minister, God's calling me to preach. I had no idea these 54 years later what I was about to carry. I think it's good to preach on these minor characters from Paul. Let me tell you why. I think Joe Sixpack has a hard time identifying with Paul or Abraham or Elijah or David. And he's thinking, I'm not going to walk out of Ur and start a whole nation. I'm not going to be the greatest king. In I'm not. But Epaphroditus, Joe Sixpack, can identify. Here's somebody who faithfully carried something for Jesus and his cause. I think there's real richness in preaching some sermons on these supporting actors uh, in the Pauline circle. There's more identity with them. Joe Sixpack, he didn't think he could be Abraham or Moses, but you know, I might be able to carry something for him and be faithful doing it. So, a minor character. Now, um, let's do one, one, more, uh, one more thing and we'll take our final questions. 3, 5 through 16, to me, my favorite passage, I call it life's ledger. The image is that of a ledger. What do you write down on the credit side of a ledger and what on the debit side? Now, ledger is kind of a dated term right now. It might be something like QuickBooks or a spreadsheet where you got profit <laughs> and loss. What do you put in the profit column of your life and what do you put in the lost column? That's the image. And here, Paul, for purposes of argument, in a sense, brags on himself for a few verses. You remember it. He talks about the dogs up in verse two. Beware of the dogs. There he's talking about the Judaizers, those who told people they had to become Jews in order to become Christians. Wanted to make them legalists like the Pharisees. He says, beware of the dogs, of the false circumcision. Everywhere he went, he was bedeviled by people, legalists who wanted to return people to the bondage of keeping the numberless prohibitions and admonitions of the Mosaic law. He said, beware of the dogs. He said, if you want to talk about dogs, it's as if he said, I was the biggest dog of all. Look at what he says. He says, look at his paternity, circumcised the eighth day, 
perfect under the law. Look at his nationality. He was an Israelite. That is, he was not a Hellenistic Jew, a Jewish convert, a Greek, a Hellenistic Jew. He says, I was the real deal. Look at his tribalism. He was from Benjamin. Benjamin was the favorite tribe. It was kind of like the mascot of the nation, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That meant he was not a Hellenistic Jew. He grew up speaking the mother tongue of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee, that was his rigorism. He says, I kept the law of Moses perfectly. You have to remember that it was subdivided into hundreds of sub commandments in the Talmud down to the point of ridiculous. If a fly landed on your face on the Sabbath, you couldn't hit it or you'd be hunting. He just let the fly crawl around. Really? He said, I was perfect when it came to keeping the Mosaic law. As to zeal, I was the persecutor of the church. That was my rigorism. And he sums it up. Concerning the righteousness of the law, I was blameless. I kept all of the subdivisions of the Ten Commandments. It's always interesting to illustrate that to people. For example, Jews were not supposed to pull a chair across the room in their own house on the Sabbath, lest they move any dust and that would be plowing. He said, I was perfect. He said, I wrote all that down on the credit side of the ledger. Yeah. Circumcised, tribe of Benjamin, nationalism, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But he said, everything I put on the credit side, profit, I now put on the debit side. All his credentials. He says, I take, and, and you know what he did. I mean, I'm not going to soften it. He said, not only did I put it on the debit side, let me tell you what they are. I count them as the Greek word skubala. It's an ugly sounding word, isn't it? Skubala. It means dung. Excrement. If I was trying to communicate with Joe Sixpack, I could think of several words. <laughs> I count them as dung, as excrement. What was to me on the credit side of the ledger, I've put on the debit. For the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now here's a tremendous opportunity to use an image that most people would understand, credit and debit, profit and loss, P and L in life's great P and L. Everything I once counted to be of great value, I now count to be, well, he says, <laughs> done. How can you do that, Paul? Let me just give you one final image and we'll have a moment for Q&A. I love this image. Not that I've already obtained it, already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. I want to be able to grasp that for which preveniently I have already been grasped. If you go out to Spurgeon's College in South London at, at a landing on the steps, there's this interesting thing. It's, it's hand. And the motto of the college, et tenior, et tenio, et tenior. It's Latin. I hold and I am held. It's up there. It's on a landing. It's a stained glass window. Right out of this verse. I hold. Yes but I am held. If you catch the essence of the images in this book, that right there may be it. I've not obtained it. I press on, there's strenuousness in that word. There's energy in that word. I hold and I am held. I think of Oatman's hymn. He wrote thousands of hymns. One of them really stuck. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining. Every day though these may dwell where some are found. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. I press on. 